Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the International Solar Alliance Expert Training Course. This is session 44 of this training series focusing on solar heating and cooling. In this session, we're going to look more closely at solar heating and cooling technologies, followed by some case studies of where some of these technologies have been used in different markets around the world. I'm Toby Couture from E3 Analytics, and I'll be giving this training session. The supporters of this training series are the International Solar Alliance and the Clean Energy Solutions Center. This training is part of module eight out of this training series, focusing specifically on the issue of solar heating and cooling. Quick overview of the presentation before we dive in. We'll look at the learning objective. We'll cover the core of the presentation, followed by a few concluding remarks. I've included a number of references and uh, resources for further reading. And then, as with all the other training sessions, there will be a knowledge check at the end with some multiple choice questions at the end of the session. So let's dive in. The main learning objectives are first to understand the basics of solar heating and cooling technologies, understand how they work, what their main advantages and disadvantages are, understand which technologies are currently most widespread, are being used most widely, and to understand different case studies of solar heating and cooling technologies in practice. Different applications, where they've been installed, and some of the performance characteristics. So, broadly speaking, solar heating and cooling systems can be small scale targeted at single family homes or single applications like car washes or other sites that have very high hot water usage. They can be medium scale for schools, hospitals, universities and the like, institutional buildings, or they can be large scale targeting industrial applications, and even providing process heat for industrial processes. In some cases, and in a growing number of cities in particular around the world, solar heating and cooling technologies are starting to provide heating and cooling energy to entire districts and entire communities. One of the more well-known examples is in Copenhagen, where many of the cities, um, the, the overwhelming majority of the city's buildings and uh, residences and businesses are connected to the district heating network. Solar is being used in growing quantities uh, using solar collectors that feed the heat, the thermal energy directly into the district heating network and contribute to transitioning that heating network to growing shares of renewable energy over time as they phase out the use of coal um, in particular in the heating system. So there are ways of using solar heating and cooling technologies at a wide variety of different scales for different applications. So much like solar PV technologies, they're highly modular, they're highly adaptable to context, and they can be used in just about every market um, around the world. As we'll see, there's been much focus in particular on solar heating technologies and comparatively, there's been much more written about solar heating technologies, much more analysis done as well as much more technological innovation, development, R&D, uh, as well as just fundamentally more companies focusing on the solar heating market versus or when compared to the solar cooling market. But as we'll see, by, lift, by looking a little bit more closely at the solar cooling market, there's actually some interesting um, market potential there. And this is likely to be a growing market opportunity and an increasingly exciting market opportunity in the years ahead. In certain countries around the world, like Barbados, Cyprus, and Israel, to name three, between 80 and 90% of residential homes have domestic solar hot water systems. So very high levels of adoption, far higher than in many uh, countries in Europe or in North America. Um, 
very high levels of adoption. Part of this has been driven by building codes and by mandates, essentially obligations to install or to adopt uh, solar hot water systems. And we'll look at this a little bit more closely in the session um, on solar heating and cooling policies. So if you're interested in understanding a little bit more about how policy tools are being used to scale up these markets, uh, then I encourage you to have a look at that session as well. In cold climates, heat demand alone represents somewhere between 60 and up to 87% of energy demand in residential buildings and between 30 and 40% of energy demand in warmer climates, mainly due to hot water use. So heat is a big deal. Estimates are that across cities in Europe, building related heat demand represents somewhere around 50% of total energy demand. It was a very significant share of total energy demand. We often think of, when we think of energy, we think of oil and we think of electricity. The reality is thermal energy needs, just heating alone is a tremendous um, part of our energy, of our energy mix. And that's why we're focusing these sessions specifically on looking at some renewable energy um, options for heating and cooling that are becoming more prominent <clears throat> and more prevalent in the market. Now, part of this is also driven by economics. Solar heating systems are increasingly affordable. The return on investment can be as little as three to six years, depending on the market segment and depending on uh, energy costs. So either natural gas costs or um, electricity costs, depending on how heating is uh, or cooling uh, is provided. So can be quite attractive. And as the technology continues, to, as the technologies continue to develop, they're also getting better, getting more efficient. We're getting um, more advanced products, including some hybrid technologies, as we'll have a closer look at in some of the slides ahead, that are really enabling new efficiencies to be harnessed out of uh, technologies that have been around, in fact, for decades. Solar heating and cooling systems can help residents, residents, businesses, as well as governments and institutions save money on their heating and cooling costs. That is increasingly the market driver in this, in this market segment. As the costs of natural gas uh, increase in many markets, and as the cost of electricity continue to increase, it becomes more attractive to start looking at solar heating and cooling uh, rather than relying on the sources that have traditionally provided heating and cooling demand. Now, it's important to underscore that in most cases, at least in, in uh, developed sort of OECD countries, solar heating and cooling technologies are used as a supplement to heating and cooling needs. There are only, there are f f uh, only select applications where solar heating and cooling can fully displace reliance on um, other sources of heating and cooling as backup. So in many cases, electricity will be there as stand-in, either um, as a backup uh, source, or there'll be small natural gas boilers, particularly in commercial applications, to provide the backup energy to, to top up the, uh, the heating or cooling needs. If the solar resource is not adequate, or if it's we've sent several cloudy days or um, or very extreme uh, temperature shifts, so that's important to keep in mind as we focus through this. In many cases, just as um, many all hospitals and many hotels around the world have backup diesel generators in case the grid goes down. Similarly heating and cooling systems often have backup and have redundancy uh, built into them. Water heating, space heating, and space cooling account for an estimated 70% of the energy used in the average U.S. household. So again, this, this really helps put into perspective the, the tremendous market opportunity, tremendous potential for 
um, doing more of that with renewable energy sources. The great thing is the sun is available. It is in most cases adequate to meet a substantial share of um, household energy thermal needs. And that's why we're seeing as technologies get better and as awareness grows, we're seeing uh, a growing number of companies and, and homes and indeed governments investing directly in doing this for their own, uh, to meet their own needs. In most countries, the sector has suffered a little bit from being uh, led mostly by SMEs, small companies without global reach, um, without significant R&D departments, essentially producing fairly um, rudimentary solar thermal systems using local components. It's often manufactured locally with less quality control and a high variation in system performance, as well as system design between countries. And you'll see this if you travel in different markets in Africa or indeed in different markets in Asia. The technologies differ quite widely. Uh, the costs are all over the map and there's a fairly uh, significant difference in product performance. So unlike solar PV, solar photovoltaics, which have become um, very much a globalized commodity, which have international standards and fairly high uh, and consistent performance metrics across the board, monitoring different aspects of output and degradation and so on, the level of standardization and a level of consistency and, and sort of performance monitoring going on for solar thermal systems is significantly less than for solar PV. So that's another important reality of, of this market. It's um, fundamentally patchier, fundamentally greater variation in system performance and system design uh, between different markets. And to take one example, the traditional thermosiphon um, <clears throat> systems used in China, which are the, the sort of often uh, take the form of a vacuum tube collector, are somewhere between 10 times cheaper than Australia's systems, but again, have a shorter lifespan and are not as reliable as some of the more established products in the market in Australia. So you can see that very significant difference, not only in price, targeting different market segments to make it affordable in different markets, um, with again, significant differences in, in how these systems measure up uh, against each other. Again, to compare that with solar PV, you would never see a tenfold uh, difference in solar PV module costs from one market to the next. Um, the, the industry is much more globalized. In contrast, again, to this uh, solar heating and cooling market, which is again very much more localized and hasn't yet seen the emergence of global players on quite in quite the same way as we've seen with solar PV. And consolidation is underway, uh, particularly in China. We're seeing a major push in China towards uh, consolidating more in the direction of uh, solar flat plate collectors instead of the traditional vacuum tube or evacuated tube models, as we'll see in a moment. So there could be more consolidation in the market and we could see uh, larger companies emerge out of this uh, that start to take on a more global um, presence. So one commonly seen option that I've just referred to is these evacuated tube or vacuum tube models. <clears throat> the single tubes are collected to a, connected to a pipe and the tubes are empty essentially uh, used just to, to flow um, thermal energy. And they must be traditionally mounted at an angle to allow the condenser in the internal fluid to return to the heat absorber. So there's essentially a, a heat absorption mechanism that allows the distribution of the thermal energy to be um, delivered via conduit. These are commonly seen. You still do see them uh, quite widely in, in different markets around the world, but slowly they're starting to be replaced in key markets like China by flat plate collectors. <clears throat> and indeed, China remains by far the world's largest solar thermal market, uh, representing somewhere around 85% of the total global uh, installed capacity for solar thermal collectors. So by far and away the biggest 
uh, single market. And that's why, in a way, what happens in China has potentially significant implications for the industry um, elsewhere in the world. However, the most common technology elsewhere in the world, and increasingly even in China, is becoming the solar flat plate collector, where essentially you have a flat plate, looks a bit more like a solar um, PV array, just without the um, solar cells, with a heat conducting fluid that delivers the heat to a storage tank. These flat plate collectors are typically more efficient, with less heat loss, easier to maintain, and also are less uh, prone to breaking. Uh, one of the issues with, the th with thermal collectors, uh, those are the evacuated tubes, is they're a bit more vulnerable to, um, to damage and to maintenance issues. <clears throat> Another option that you may have seen before is sort of the, the DIY variation, the do-it-yourself model. Um, some models of solar collectors can be made at home, uh, particularly for um, space heating or air heating, not so much building your own uh, water heating solar thermal collector is possible, and there are lots of homemade models of those too. Um, but more commonly, particularly in norm northern climates where it's cold during the winter, um, is these um, models that are built essentially out of, out of paint, black painted tin cans, like pop cans. Um, that can be arranged in, in a way to, to generate heat. The heat circulates up and uh, the thermal energy can be pumped into the uh, home or building directly through a hole in the wall. So essentially a way to collect the ambient uh, or radiant solar energy that gets cast on the, um, on the collectors. And in northern climates, the coldest days are often the sunniest days. So in, in Canada or in Norway or Sweden, when you have minus 20, minus 30 degrees Celsius, you typically have clear skies, which again speaks uh, in favor of using solar thermal technologies that can still use some of that uh, thermal energy and convert it into heat that can be produced and pumped into the house. Now, these systems again are rarely if ever used to fully displace um, thermal energy needs in the building or house, they're mainly used as a supplement to supplement space heating and reduce reliance on firewood or on natural gas uh, or other heating fuels. Now, in all of these cases, um, at least the, the, the ones using a fluid to heat, the systems are accompanied by a storage tank and the storage tank can either be mounted directly on the roof or near the building, or in some cases, even within the building itself. Another technology that's starting to emerge is solar thermal collectors that use concentrating solar technology principles. So where you essentially concentrate the beams of solar uh, light onto a, um, onto a particular point, either via parabolic lens or um, via a concentrating sort of disc, um, like a satellite, like a dish. And these different technologies heat, concentrate the heat to such a high level that you can actually get very high, even boiling um, temperatures that can then be used um, to, to produce a higher quality or higher gradient of heat and be injected into different thermal energy applications, uh, including even for industrial process heat. So we're seeing a growing number of uh, industrial applications starting to use these kinds of concentrating tube or concentrating solar thermal technologies because they produce again, a higher uh, temperature um, gradient that can be used both to operate the system uh, and reduce electricity cost, reduce electricity usage, but also, um, again, can be used for, for applications that need uh, higher temperatures, in particular in the industrial sector, in abattoirs, for example, for meat processing, 
um, there are lots of lots of applications that need that hot water at a, at a high temperature. And these additional, the concentrators enable that. Um, it, these concentrating solar technologies also enable more solar energy to be harnessed out of a smaller roof space. So there's, you, you get higher thermal gain um, from, the usable, from the usable roof space. Now again, these technologies, however, are not always applicable depending on the local circumstances. If there is a high incidence of dust or a high incidence of smog in the city, these kinds of concentrating collectors are often not a good solution because they require unrefracted or only very lightly refracted sunlight in order to function um, optimally. So if you have significant smog during the daytimes uh, in, in the city, these kinds of collectors are unlikely to, to perform as, um, as expected. So they work best in climates with relatively clear skies in areas where it's relatively clear uh, weather and where um, sand and ambient dust is not uh, as big of an issue. Now, this presentation is, is focusing on solar heating and cooling. So enough about heating, let's talk about cooling. Active solar cooling technologies are more recent uh, than solar thermal or solar heating technologies. And as a result, are somewhat less established in the market. They're also less well known. Some of you may be saying, wait a minute, Solar cooling, um, what does that mean? Now, active solar cooling technologies do exist, are starting to gain ground in the market, and for a range of reasons that we'll look at more closely, their importance is likely to grow significantly in the years ahead. It's important to underscore that passive solar cooling principles instead versus active uh, cooling technologies have been used for millennia, in, including for the including the use of shade, narrow streets uh, to, particularly in the Middle East, you see this common in, in cities in ancient cities in the Middle East. Narrow streets encourage shade, which keep streets cooler and keep also residents and households cooler because you concentrate um, shade in a, in a tighter area. Now that's passive solar cooling. What we're talking about here is not the use of passive solar design principles, rather active solar cooling technologies. One key advantage of active solar cooling technologies is that their production coincides well with high cooling demand. So during the hottest days are typically uh, when you have very high uh, solar insulation and you can use that solar energy directly to um, produce cooling or what some people call cool instead of warmth. Now cooling um, is a massive and growing demand, source of demand, as we'll see in a moment. As income levels rise in particularly in lower and middle income countries around the world, air conditioning demand is exploding. We are seeing very rapid growth in air conditioner sales, which are driving very significant electricity demand growth in urban areas and is increasingly causing power outages on a regular basis in the early evening hours as people come home from work and turn on their air conditioning units. Now, the fact that this is starting to happen at scale in many emerging markets is going to be a major challenge for electricity markets in developing countries around the world. Because again, as income levels rise, people, one of the first purchases that households make to improve their quality of life in the house is an air conditioner. The total number of air conditioners, just to use one example, in use in India has grown from roughly 2 million in 2006 to approximately 30 million in 2018. And the market continues to explode. 
So very significant growth, which is leading to very significant electricity demand growth, particularly again in those early evening hours, which is exacerbating uh, power reliability issues and contributing to power outages. Now, one solution would be to, to couple air conditioning units with solar PV so you can produce solar power and store it and potentially run air conditioners off of batteries. That's one um, quite expensive solution that most households uh, currently, at least in developing countries, often do not have the resources to, to uh, invest in. Air conditioner units are uh, becoming increasingly affordable. There's also a very high, spe a very large spectrum of costs. But one of the bigger innovations that's likely to shake up the market in the coming years is shifting the actual air conditioning technologies to use other principles to be based on, for example, um, the production of ice. We're seeing uh, an emerging market now in um, solar, in, in air conditioning that can be produced as it used to be during the 19th century and early 20th century before air conditioning electric technologies really took off, where essentially it consisted of harvesting ice from frozen lakes during the winter and hotels and other clients would buy large quantities of ice, store them in cool rooms, and essentially use them to cool their buildings, um, cool their hotels for their guests during this, the hot summer months. Now, we're seeing a return of that in certain applications. And again, this underscores it this points to a fairly significant market potential for new ways of designing air conditioning units because the ice can be produced during the daytime. So the ice and the cooling energy can be stored during the daytime when solar production is at its highest. So you can use daytime solar energy to produce ice in air conditioning units that can, or at least a cool, uh, high density form of cooling energy, be it ice or, or some other format. And that cooling energy can then be used to dispatch, to gradually dissipate that cooling energy um, into the house or um, into the home or business or indeed institutional building at a later time, thereby taking some of the stress off the grid and potentially helping alleviate um, power outages. So one of the biggest challenges in markets like India and China and Indonesia and much of Africa and Latin America is that the sales of air conditioning units continue to be dominated by traditional um, air electric um, air conditioning units, not by these new, uh, newer and more adapted or better adapted models of air conditioning units. And that itself is going to, is already creating uh, a range of issues. So tremendous market opportunity for shifting, not only to solar cooling technologies, but also fundamentally re-engineering the solar, uh, the air conditioning technologies themselves. Air conditioning accounts for approximately 40% of electricity demand in cities like Mumbai in India. And over half of Saudi Arabia's entire peak summer electricity demand is attributed to air conditioning. So over half is just a tremendous electricity demand um, is just from air conditioning. That underscores, again, the, 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 the tremendous importance and tremendous opportunity in um, solar cooling and other air conditioning technologies. Of the 2.8 billion people worldwide that live in the hottest parts of the world, only an estimated 8% currently have air conditioning systems. So again, compared to adoption rates of over 90% in parts of the US and Japan. So very, very, um, again, significant market potential. An analysis of 52 of the most vulnerable countries in the world recently found that 1.1 billion people worldwide face immediate cooling related risks, risks to their health, and also risks to, to fundamentally to public safety. And this is not just in Africa and Asia. 
a heat wave that hit Europe in 2003, now that the, the numbers have been crunched, is estimated to have been responsible for over 14,800 deaths in France alone, with the death toll Europe-wide estimated in the range of 70,000. So even in, in Europe and in North America, the need for reliable, sustainable cooling is tremendous. And this is likely to become an increasingly urgent issue as temperature extremes continue to become more uh, prevalent. This graph uh, captures the productivity impacts of heat caused by excessive heat. And we'll connect this to an anecdote in, in a moment, but it's worth just taking a moment and looking at this. These are the estimates of daylight working hours lost due to excessive heat by region. So if you look in 1975, uh, the numbers in, uh, in South Asia are already over seven um, hours lost due to excessive heat. And you can see the spread across as that number grows, as heat becomes an ever greater, uh, carries an ever greater economic toll on, uh, fundamentally on productivity in different parts of the world. So again, this underscores the tremendous important, uh, importance of cooling. We, historically, we focused almost exclusively on heating, and this really needs to change. The importance of cooling is, is is just too great to ignore. One visionary who saw the shift and who recognized the importance of cooling uh, is the founder of Singapore, who made air conditioning a leading development priority. When he came into power in 1959, he mandated the installation of, public, of air conditioners in all public buildings, specifically in order to improve the productivity of the civil service in Singapore. And here he's quoted saying, air conditioning was a most important invention for us, perhaps one of the signal inventions of history. It changed the nature of civilization by making development possible in the tropics. And again, you can really see here um, why, um, as we've saw, as we've seen in previous, in some of the previous slides, why cooling is so important, the impacts on productivity, on workable hours, and just fundamentally on human well-being. Um, and this case of Singapore is, is often um, used to underscore how fundamentally energy, and in particular in this case, cooling demand, cooling supply is so important to um, to economic growth more, more broadly. So there are some advantages of using renewable forms of cooling instead of just using traditional air conditioning technologies that are connected to electricity, that are connected to the power from the grid that may come from coal or from uh, a range of other uh, sources, including natural gas uh, and so forth. There are advantages of using solar technologies directly for um, producing cooling energy. And we'll look a little bit more closely at some of those technologies in a moment, but first, some of the advantages. The availability of high solar radiation when the cooling is actually needed, in particular on sunny days. Thermal energy often drives the system, which leads to higher overall efficiency, so you don't need as many active pumps because the solar energy can actually drive, the, is enough to drive the, the, the mechanics of the system. Solar cooling technologies have lower operating costs, lower electrical power ratings, are relatively durable, produce cost savings, and can be used in combination with other cooling and air conditioning systems. So they can act as a supplement to other cooling um, solutions, just as some solar heating technologies are used as a complement to other heating um, sources. Some of the disadvantages, clearly uh, potentially high upfront installed cost, depending on the application. There is a lack of skilled experts and installers, as well as um, high performance products. And you require suitable roof space. In many cases, particularly for hospitals or hotels, backup systems are often required to build in uh, redundancy. But 
those disadvantages uh, aside, this is again remains a an area of tremendous need and a tremendous opportunity. So let's let's look at some of the technologies more closely to get back to that question of what do we actually mean by solar cooling. Many of you have no doubt heard of solar thermal technologies, but solar cooling is the relatively new kid on the block. We'll look here at three. Absorption chillers with a B, adsorption chillers with a D, as well as desiccant-based cooling systems, and essentially that use drying or dehumidifying to produce uh, cooling. So let's look at these. First, absorption chillers. They use hot water from solar collectors to absorb already pressurized refrigerant from a refrigerant mixture. The mixture is either a couple examples here, water lithium bromide and ammonia water. Condensation and evaporation of this refrigerant vapor provides the same cooling effect as that provided by mechanical cooling systems or traditional uh, air conditioning systems. They still require electricity, but a small fraction compared to the electricity needs of a conventional air conditioner. So it's a bit like, think of it a bit like a heat pump. A heat pump uses thermal exchange, but it still needs an electrical, it needs to be connected to the electricity in order to operate. So it's still small electricity demand, but um, still electricity demand, just much smaller than would be used with uh, either an, with an electric uh, air conditioner. And again, this electricity can be supplied directly via solar PV. So many solar cooling systems have both the solar cooling collectors and technologies combined with a PV panel to directly supply the um, appliance. You see here a picture on the left of an absorption chiller and an adsorption chiller on the right, which we'll look at more carefully in a moment. I'll leave this on the screen just so you can look a little bit at the mechanics and how these work. Um, the, the, the heat and the rejected heat, the condenser, the evaporator, and how the basic um, mechanics of the system works. For more information on this, I've provided a link to a report that gives a nice overview of some of these technologies um, here. Now, Adsorption chillers use a solid instead of a liquid, like a silica gel. There are two compartments, one evaporator and one for the condenser. They still require electricity, but a small fraction, again, compared to the electricity needs of a conventional air conditioner, as there's no internal pump to require to pump the fluid around, because the material used as a sorption source is a solid not a liquid. These are often larger for larger capacity chillers range from 500 or 50 kilowatts to 500 kilowatts. So again, more for industry, for uh, commercial buildings, institutional buildings like universities, hospitals, and so forth. These adsorption chillers are fairly robust and fairly simple in construction and their design. There's no dangers of crystallization. Um, one disadvantage is that they are considerably heavier than uh, the alternatives. Third, we'll turn to these desiccant-based systems. These are open cycle systems that use water as a refrigerant in direct contact with the air. The cycle is thermally driven they combine an evaporative cooling principle with air dehumidification by means of a desiccant, so some kind of drying material that absorbs. You may think of a desiccant like sometimes in um, clothing or shoes that you may buy, there's little sachets, little, little bags or pouches with um, desiccant type silica solids uh, that suck moisture out just to, to keep products fresh or to keep them from developing moisture. Um, desiccant, that's essentially a desiccant. Sucks moisture out of the environment. And as you know, one of the main drivers of heat is humidity levels. So when humidity is very high, it's very hot. And that's what makes 
um, temperatures are so difficult to bear in uh, urban environments, particularly in the tropics, when there are high heats, because the heat, the, the, the humidity is so high that it, it's very difficult, even at, um, without needing to get up to 50 degrees Celsius, the humidity um, can make it feel much, much hotter. So the basic principle of these desiccant technologies is take some of that humidity out of the air and achieve cooling that way. Liquid or solid materials can be used as desiccants. Um, and commonly they use different rotating desiccant wheels that are equipped with silica gel or lithium chloride as absorption material. And the wheels can turn alternating and produce, uh, essentially enable more humidity to be um, withdrawn from the air. These solar assisted cooling technologies using a desiccant use solar thermal energy to dry out or to regenerate the desiccant. That's essentially the basic um, principle. And they produce conditioned air directly. So the systems uh, help maintain a more, um, more pleasant ambient air by, via the operation of the system. And here's a diagram showing essentially how this works with the example of the desiccant wheel. The ambient air, so the humid air enters in, goes through the desiccant wheel, um, a heating coil and a fan to pump the system, and then the return air you see here going through above the top with a filter the heat recovery wheel, and then again, the desiccant wheel and the fan. So that's in a nutshell, essentially the, the mechanism is sucking humidity, sucking moisture out of the air in order to contribute to a cooling uh, effect. And these can be powered by solar and solar thermal technologies. The advantages of desiccant based systems clearly Increased comfort, as again, temperature and humidity are controlled independently, and the humidity can be adjusted to reduce the temperature. They have lower operating costs than traditional air conditioning units. They use much less energy than traditional air conditioning units. There's also heat recovery options. The resulting air quality is improved, and there's reduced building maintenance uh, due to high humidity levels. So high humidity in institutional, public buildings, schools, hospitals, and so forth is a major source of uh, the buildup of mold, of, fung of fungal growth, uh, as well as of bacteria. And by reducing the humidity levels inside buildings, a much more um, pleasant ambient environment is created, but also, again, an environment that's less uh, prone to the development of bacteria and molds which can, can reduce long-term building maintenance costs. A fourth option that we'll flag quickly before moving into some of the case studies uh, is the hybrid use of solar PV combined with solar um, thermal applications. You see here two different diagrams essentially showing different variations on the same principle. Um, solar PV modules are layered in on top and beneath the solar module, the residual heat that's left that, that radiates through is used to heat a uh, coil essentially that produces thermal energy. So these hybrid systems are becoming increasingly widely used and indeed some argue that this will be the default, um, that this is the future of solar is hybrid systems. Why, why would we just install PV module only applications when we can have, when we can use the same limited roof space and do both in one integrated system. And this partly has been enabled also by uh, transparent solar PV modules. So we're seeing new technologies on the market that are eff effectively transparent that enable you to collect electricity um, without blocking the sunlight. So those are a perfect application here. 
Obviously, clear advantages of these hybrid technologies, you get more energy output because you get both electricity and heat from the same surface area. But interestingly, a further benefit here is that you get increased solar PV output because the solar um, thermal system collecting the heat actually helps cool the PV panels, which increases module efficiency. So solar panels often have um, higher efficiencies at cooler temperatures. So um, not at 30 or 40 degrees Celsius, um, as is commonly thought. They actually convert electricity better at somewhat cooler temperatures. So the cooling effect of collecting some of that thermal energy um, can actually improve PV module output. So you get not only thermal energy on top, you even get a bit more uh, PV output as well from the electricity. And finally, of course, it can reduce the visual impact on buildings of, have two, of having two different kinds of panel types. So if, for example, solar thermal evacuated tubes or plates, flat plates, as well as solar PV. So instead of having both integrated into one and get two birds with one stone. So having looked at some of these different technologies, again, this, isn't, this presentation, we only have one hour, so we don't have time to cover everything. Don't have time to be comprehensive. You may be wondering, what about this technology? What about that technology? We had to limit to a, a subset, and I've tried to give um, a flavor of some of these different applications in these uh, case studies selected from different jurisdictions uh, around the world. So let's dive into these case studies before we wrap up. So here in uh, Washington, D.C., a residential solar system was installed on a private home with a large outdoor pool. The system is configured to transfer heat from the house into the pool while evacuating excess heat through the collectors. Active year-round and can operate 24 hours a day. So this is really a thermal regulation system, not only just used to generate heat to trap heat, it's also used to evacuate excess heat, thereby producing a cooling effect within the house. Household annual electricity consumption dropped a stunning from 80 megawatt hours per year to seven megawatt hours per year with the introduction of this system, again, driven by the massive savings on the air conditioning load. The system meets about 92% of the home's space water and pool heating needs, as well as 100% of its cooling needs. So this kind of integrated thermal regulation system um, really, under, really shows the, the benefits of this kind of integrated application where you can get such um, high energy gains from the application of the system. Now, this is quite a large system for a residential home. The rated power output on the thermal side is 15.5 kilowatt thermal, um, larger obviously than most houses would need. But again, you can see here that when integrated into this kind of um, thermal, thermal network uh, with, a, with an, the ability to evacuate excess energy from the house out into the pool, um, the gains can be quite, uh, in terms of energy savings, can be quite dramatic. Here, another residential home in Florida, 40 kilowatts. Again, very large application for a residential household. Um, the U.S. likes their houses. They, many, many homes in the U.S. Um, are quite large by, by international standards. Um, 40, kilowatt hours, or 40 kilowatts of hybrid solar PV thermal panels were installed at a large private home, generating both electricity and collecting the heat. So this is one of these solar hybrid applications that we just saw. It's referred to as solar PV thermal or PVT. It can produce up to four times the, the total energy of solar PV alone. And on this project, they found that the cooling effect of the thermal collectors boosted the PV system output by as much as 20%. So you can see here that this is not just um, small potatoes. The difference here can be quite significant. The combined output of both systems is 57.8 kilowatts for combined PV and thermal, and the yearly energy savings combined are at, talking here, 50 megawatt hours. 
which again is a very significant um, amount of power. So if you think 50 megawatt hours, if you think of an average megawatt hour costing somewhere between 10, between 100 and $200, you're talking between 5,000 and $10,000 dollars of energy savings per year so the payback time you know if you're factoring in okay how much would a system like that cost um, when you're saving that kind of money you can you can pay the system off quite um, quite handily another case study here of a large uh, apartment complex 52 units using a hybrid solar pv and thermal system part of a comprehensive renovation project. Residents in the complex benefit from more comfortable living spaces as well as lower energy bills using both solar electricity on site as well as solar um, thermal for hot water needs. The rated power output of the system is almost 33 kilowatt hours, annual energy savings of, 20, of over 20 megawatt hours. Another case here of a large residential complex in Bozeman, Montana, 136 units, um, specifically for lower income households. Again, residents benefit from lower energy bills than the state or regional average and cleaner energy supply. Each individual unit is accompanied with or by a 216 gallon storage tank, 818 liters. Uh, which is a very massive solar tank storage tank, but again is there to produce uh, and designed to meet the majority, if not all, of the household's um, hot water needs. Total power output for the 136 units is 212 kilowatts, and the yearly energy savings estimated at somewhere in the range of 138 uh, megawatt hours. A very sizable. Um, savings for the complex. Here an example in uh, an, a lodge in Palo Alto in California. Uh, there are some other examples from around the world. These are many mostly focused on the US because the data and case study material uh, is more readily available from the US than many other markets. The system provides hot water for the facility's pool and the aim of the project in this case is specifically to reduce natural gas consumption. Um, because gas prices are um, a major cost driver for the lodge. Rated power output 78 kilowatt hours, uh, kilowatts with annual savings of somewhere on the range of 400 um, megawatt hours of thermal energy. So quite sizable, quite substantial. Um, another example here from California in Bakersfield, a hybrid solar PV and solar thermal system. Uh, those integrated panels that we saw including um, 42 hybrid collectors plus 18 PV only panels. Heats the hotel's water and pool and the backup heating is provided by two heat pumps as well as two backup gas boilers. And you can see here some of the stats on the power output as well as the savings. Example from Hawaii at an inn, a large system delivering, again, a hybrid system, delivering hot water, as well as uh, heating and cooling, um, including electricity. Each sy the system comes equipped with a large storage tank, rated power output of 56 kilowatt hours with yearly energy savings of about 56 megawatt hours. An example here from Massachusetts at a college uh, for a large athletic center here featuring an Olympic sized swimming pool large collectors. They received a rebate from the state government. Um, they had a commercial scale solar hot water rebate program. The system provides the entire facility's hot water needs, includes a 360 gallon uh, storage tank capacity. You can see here some of the specs at the bottom with here the energy savings uh, around 72 megawatt hours thermal. Here another an example in Arizona um, at a school covered with double glazed collectors, lithium bromide chillers with a capacity of 1.75 megawatts provides the cooling. During the summer, the system meets all of the school's cooling needs with backup occasionally needed from the old electric chillers on site. 
the system, interestingly, has been financed and developed on an ESCO basis, essentially with a company that owns the cooling system and provides cooling energy as a service to the school at a discount to the utility um, cost of service. So essentially, the school is saving money by paying the ESCO cooling company less than what they would pay from their utility. And the local utility goes one further, even pays subsidies for the avoided energy use because it helped the utility defer grid upgrade investments. So again, some win-wins there. You can see here a couple examples of different schools, uh, different installations with different specs, looking at the chiller capacity, collector capacity, the collector surface area, as well as the approximate cost of the system and the storage size. Um, you can see here, this is from an, an IRENA report um, on solar, large scale solar uh, cooling systems and gives you a snapshot. One um, example I wanted to include of the desiccant based cooling systems recently installed on a shopping center in Australia, uh, in Victoria, in the state of Victoria. Cooling loads represent as much as 60% of the total energy demand of large commercial spaces like these shopping centers. The system uses a closed loop design with two desiccant wheels to remove moisture from the air, effectively acting as a dehumidifier, as we saw. A high temperature wheel uses solar heat for regeneration of the desiccant, while a low temperature wheel functions without any external heat to deliver greater energy efficiency. And there's an indirect evaporative cooler that reduces the temperature of the dehumidified air without altering the moisture content of the air. So quite an advanced system. You can read a bit more about this here at the link provided below. Um, the interesting thing about this system is that it was installed using a concentrating solar thermal system. Heat is stored in a thermal tank and this desiccant technology um, is um, the foundation of the, uh, of the solar cooling application. They estimate that this uh, concentrating solar cooling approach uses 40% less roof space than traditional um, single stage desiccant air conditioning system would. Another example here at an industrial site. So we've looked at single family residential, we've looked at, uh, mind you, large single family residential, we've looked at um, multi-unit residential, we've looked at a couple institutional and school and shopping center applications. Here's one final one on a commercial uh, industrial facility at a beef processing facility. This uh, project was structured also as a kind of uh, ESCO type arrangement with a bilateral power purchase agreement struck at a price 40% lower than what the company was paying before. Uh, essentially the company benefits from savings from day one and the solar thermal system provides um, zero, essentially was financed at zero upfront cost to the company because it's developed again by this third party um, ESCO type company. Um, the rated power output is quite large, uh, almost 800 kilowatts, and the estimated annual energy savings are in the range of 700 megawatt hours of thermal. So very sizable um, energy savings for the facility, as well as we can see here as a significant cost saving because the structure is designed to guarantee savings from day one. An example from Europe in Graz, Austria, and we're almost, we're almost done with uh, these case studies and we need to wrap up. Um, a large scale district heating system powered by solar thermal in part uh, connects a number of different neighborhoods and a uh, collector area of over 15,000 square meters with weekly timescales to provide long-term thermal storage. So the storage system is designed essentially to um, really enable longer multiple day over week timescales uh, of thermal energy storage. Some examples here from uh, different parts um, 
of the, the contribution in this project in Graz and Austria with different systems that have been installed over time. And finally, in uh, Munich in Germany, a residential area that uses district heating network based mainly on solar thermal. It was built between 2005 and 2007 on former military barracks, high efficiency housing, uh, 3,600 square meters of solar rooftop collectors, as well as a 6,000 cubic meter tank for hot water storage. So very sizable uh, hot water storage tank that meets approximately 50% of the community's heat demand. So again, there's a growing market here and we can see uh, for larger scale storage units that can store thermal energy over days, weeks, and indeed in some cases even months um, over time. Now, let's wrap up with a few concluding remarks. As we've seen, there are countless applications for solar heating and cooling technologies in a range of different facilities using a range of different heating and cooling technologies, often in combination with one another. Sports and recreation facilities, spas, hotels, shopping centers, commercial sites with large hot water needs like the beef processing facility, schools, hospitals, public buildings, residential homes, and even multi-unit residential buildings. Again, wide range of potential um, and uses. The market is, particu is in, particularly in solar cooling is virtually untapped, which means there's tremendous potential for growth and for producing more sustainable, more renewable uh, forms of cooling. District thermal applications are also opening up new market potential and solar cooling is growing very rapidly in certain parts of the world led by a few markets like Australia and certain parts of the US. Um, and we're likely to see a lot more of this in the years ahead. But as with many, every other sector in the renewable energy industry, it's necessary to have the skills, to have the technologies, to have the workforce that can deliver the technologies and install the technologies needed to make this transition. So there's much more work needed to help make solar heating and cooling technologies mainstream in markets around the world. So with that, Thank you very much for your attention. Some further reading for those of you who are interested in diving a little bit more deeply into this, a few reports on policy and on technologies, some publications here on this one from uh, some European case studies, as well as some technology overviews and uh, some examples from the IEA, as well as IRENA, looking at different um, solar heating and cooling applications. So with that, I'm Toby Couture from E3 Analytics. I'd like to thank the International Solar Alliance for supporting this training series, as well as the Clean Energy Solutions Center. And before we wrap up, please stick around for the knowledge checkpoint with a few multiple choice questions. Thank you very much again for your attention and wishing you all a great day.